Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last episode of Executive Chat Live, a webinar where Bocconi University meets important guests to discuss the impact of coronavirus in the society and the economy as a whole. Uh, we have learned many things so far. We have learned how universities uh, and uh, newspapers are changing their business model in order to face uh, the dramatic impact uh, of uh, COVID-19. We have discussed how the life sciences sectors are changing and how innovation and entrepreneurship is becoming even more vital for the future. And today in this last episode, we couldn't but conclude with uh, an important uh, discussion on the economy. Uh, clearly, uh, COVID uh, has been uh, uh, something which refers to uh, a medical uh, emergency, but uh, we have all learned that uh, the economic impact uh, will be, of course, dramatic. And so we have really to understand whether the different countries are doing the right thing and whether the recovery fund is something which makes sense. And overall, what is the outlook for the future? And even today, we have two wonderful guests. So let me briefly introduce them and thank them for being with us. So first of all, let me introduce uh, Laurence uh, Boone, who is the chief economist of OECD. And it's a great pleasure, Laurent, to be uh, with, us, with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan Mario, and hi to everybody. And Laurent is connected it's from Paris. As well. Of course. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Francesco Giavazzi, who is a professor of economics and vice chairman of the Bocconi uh, International Advisory Council. And I would say also very popular open ed contributor to Corriere della Sera. Uh, thank you, Francesco, for being with us. Hello to everybody. So basically, uh, let me get started with, uh, with uh, Laurent, because uh, OECD has just released uh, the latest uh, economic outlook. Uh, an outlook which uh, uh, I understand for the first time uh, has provided two uh, likely scenarios for the future. And so I would really love to ask you uh, if you can share with us uh, the fundamental highlights uh, that uh, come out from, uh, from, from the outlook. Laurent. Thanks, and Mario. Um, as you as you were saying, it was probably one of the most. Um, I mean, forecasting is never easy, but this was one of the most difficult uh, exercise of of projections ever. Uh, and the first thing is ob obviously that, as you know, we're facing enormous uncertainty. Uh, we know very little about the virus. We know it's receding in this part of the world. It's still expanding in other parts of the world, but we don't know whether uh, once you've got it, you have immunity. We don't know whether it can come back in the fall. Uh, we don't know whether uh, the confinement measures we have implemented will be enough to prevent another wave. So faced with them, um, with this huge really huge uncertainty we thought that we could not make projections as as usual um, which is as you know to have a central scenario and then some simulation about it uh, but that we had to do things differently so so we have made in fact two sets of projection two scenario one in which the virus is contained and and slowly we recover uh, as usual, but I'll come back to this. It won't be life as before because the virus is still around. Uh, and another scenario where the virus comes back and, and we have to go into some form of confinement again. Also, it would be obviously less stringent, more focused, more targeted because we've, we've learned a few things uh, about this virus. Um, it's because because it has been such a shock and because it continues to be here what, what that means is that the formidable shock to our economy which has been totally unprecedented in in peacetime uh, we will have long-lasting scars so to to start with the magnitude of the shock uh, is is just incredible it's a contraction of 10 percent for world gdp uh, which has never seen uh, before and and because we will not be able to recover all sectors in the same way uh, as we used to live before covid what we see as well is that by the end of 2021 which is the end of our projection horizon then income and GDP is still below what it would have been otherwise in fact depending on the scenario 
we we miss, uh, we will have forgone between five to eight years of income. Um, one of the typical feature of this scenario is uh, in both cases, because we're reopening the economy, the, the first phase of reopening is a sharp V because you go from an activity of zero to an activity which is higher uh, than zero in, in those sectors. Uh, but then, you know, we're going to reach a sort of sailing because borders, uh, some borders will remain closed because some sectors will be affected by new regulation about physical distancing and um, because some sectors will not be able to operate uh, as they were doing before. Um, and if we get another outbreak on top of this with another period of confinement, even if it is lighter, then we'll get a very subdued 2021. So um, I think one, one fair thing to say is, is we're, we're in this, this situation for quite uh, a long time, which is why we had this tight rope uh, title. Mm. Now, the good news, which is also unprecedented into this exercise, is that governments have provided massive support. They've subsidized, subsidized wages, they've provided uh, funding for firms, credit line, they've guaranteed some credit, they've deferred taxes and charges. We've, we've never seen as well such a massive and large amount of support to firms and to people which mostly comes from learning from previous crises and in particular the financial crisis. So that, that has buffered the shock, even if it remains very high, tremendously. Um, and obviously central banks have also been super active, again, uh, stepping up, really leveling up from, uh, from what happened in the financial crisis. Now, hey, another you, feature... Can, 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 let, me, let me ask a, a question to, to Francesco with respect to what you just said. Francesco, th th did you expect a reaction like that by governments and banks? Because what Loran is saying is that uh, clearly this has been an unusual shock, uh, dramatic, and even uh, you know, in the case of the two scenarios she uh, depicted, uh, there will be, of course, uh, a, a recession that uh, not necessarily uh, will be easy to, to recover. And so... Um, what, what is your reaction in terms of what banks and governments did so far, at least? Uh, no surprise on the side of central banks. So central banks understood they should be proactive in 2008. Uh, in 2008, they saved the world. But governments, uh, a bit less in the US, but certainly in Europe, didn't do much or anything. This time, the surprise is that governments uh, did a lot, but also that in Europe, uh, the European Commission stepped in and is planning to do a lot. And this, in a sense, much more resilient, because we know that the support of the central bank is like opening a fire with a lot of paper. It, uh, it hits up for 30 seconds, uh, while if you do it using fiscal policy, it's more long lasting. So the, the big surprise at this time, uh, government in general and uh, European institution in Europe stepped in which they hadn't done last time. Laurent, can I also ask you the same question before you continue? Uh, were you surprised by the reaction of governments and banks, given also your expertise as advisor of the French uh, prime minister uh, in your past uh, career? Um, I think, you know, we, it's, we, we've gone from one surprise to another surprise. I don't think, uh, I, I don't think anybody expected uh, this pandemic to be that large, that uh, expected people to be able to go into containment. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's true. I think I agree with Francesco. I know it's not good for a debate to agree, but I do agree with him that, you know, central banks had learned to be, to be heroes in, um, in, in the crisis, but this time governments have been They've provided blanket guarantee in a way that had never been done before. Uh, and what you could also consider as surprising, they've really leveraged on each other experience to do that. Um, now they, they are also very agile because the situation is changing, as you know, every week or every other week. Um, but I, I, would, I would say that the difficulties are in front of us uh, because in a way, when everything is shut down, we learn from the past more or less what to do. But now 
what will have to be done is to reopen progressively and you know protect the people who've lost their income or their firms but also provide incentive for people to to change job to move sectors for firms who needed to restructure and to reopen a new business it's it's going to be a super intensive uh, and difficult period where the agility and flexibility that policymakers have deployed uh, during the first phase of the crisis, uh, it will have to be that, but several times uh, even even more agile. And, and I think it's, it's going to be challenging, but it's reassuring that they've been so forceful in the first phase of the crisis. Sure. Can I, I jump in and ask, of course, one thing to Laurence, because uh, you know, Laurence, there is a debate among economists on this V shape that you mentioned. So there are some people like Larry Summers, the former U.S. Sec Treasury Secretary, and Larry said in a seminar in Princeton uh, a few weeks ago, by December, it will be like in December 2001. We, would for we had forgotten about the Twin Towers. I don't think it's exactly true, but that's his view. <laughs> so we'll go back to where we was and everything will be we were and everything will be forgotten. Um, while other people, uh, Nick Bloom, for instance, from Stanford, says, no, no, that would be a disaster because we have to use the uh, crisis to implement a reallocation of capital and labor and change the economy to make it more resilient to, to the virus or future virus. Where do you stand uh, uh, on, uh, because I'm a bit worried about the hurry to go back, the summer's vision, we want to go back fast and therefore we, uh, we don't care about the reallocation part. Um, so I, um, I don't want to say again. I'm, I'm more on your side than Larry's side, but um, but let me explain how how we see it because that's something we've thought really uh, as you all uh, really hard about. I think that there are three categories of sectors. There are the sectors that have, an, you know, incredibly developed uh, during the crisis, and they everything related to digital like e-commerce, for example, which, ha which has jumped massively. And what we observe from China's experience is the habit of shopping online, uh, at least for non-durable goods, persist. Um, and there's a lot of agility coming with it, a lot of novelty coming with that. Um, the sector of care, I think universally, will develop a lot more, not only uh, health as we know it, but also uh, across the world, you know, old people, house, retirees, uh, setups have been hurt very, very badly. So there will be, I think, a huge demand here. So that's one type of sectors. They're the fast growing sector, the, the one who the crisis accelerated their trend of development. Then on the other side of the spectrum, I would say that you have the sectors that have been badly hurt and and because we're going to remain in this situation for a while, because I think we should keep in mind that we won't get a vaccine or a treatment for at least 12, 18 or even 24 months, um, this change will be permanent. And that's everything related to hospitality, uh, to leisure, to entertainment, all, all those sectors, they are permanently damaged. And then in the middle, you have sectors which may be little affected by what happened, for example, construction. Um, so to me, when, when we look at the shape of the recovery, we have to look at each of these sectors and see how they map uh, into the macroeconomic outlook. And we will see more than a V for the fast growing one. Um, some return to quasi normal for, for example, construction, so the, the undisrupted one, uh, but some others will be permanently damaged. And there, I agree with you that our concern, policymakers' concern, shouldn't be to keep them unchanged and people in this job. They should be to train people so that they can change job to allow those who haven't survived or will not survive uh, as firms, I mean, to, to close down, restructure without any stigma for the, uh, for the heads of these firms, for the, for the entrepreneurs, so that they can start something new and we, we can have this reallocation of capital. And I think in that respect, and I don't know if you have that in mind, Francesco, so perhaps you could comment on this, but um, 
um, the recovery plan that governments are going to put in place, they also should favor this reallocation of capital to some extent and also accelerate some trends like investing in more more in digital you can help a lot of smes by equipping them with a digital technology and that will also help the energy transition if we improve the electronic grid uh, so i think it will be very important that we seize this opportunity to to actually give a push uh, in in what we think is the right direction Given that you're mentioning this, let me ask Francesco bluntly, what does he think uh, about this reallocation in the case of Italy? And then let me ask you in the case of Europe, Laurent, what do you think, Francesco? Is uh, so far the government uh, going in the right direction, given this uh, polarization of sectors with you know, different impact of COVID and uh, uh, the incentives that uh, they're trying to put in place? I think the difficulty, not only in Italy, but everywhere, is that politics goes in the opposite direction because politicians have a natural incentive to protect voters and voters are current workers. So it is very difficult for a politician to do the right thing, which is not to protect jobs and therefore not to create zombie form firms. Uh, in this sense, um, I looked at, at the what the market is saying. So if you look at option prices in the equity market, you, the market has a very clear idea. There are sectors where expected return, uh, the expected market return, say Apple, the expected market return like 3%, which means that the price is already relatively high. And there are sectors, uh, cruises for instance, Carnival, the expected return on Carnival is above 60%, which means that uh, the market is attaching a huge risk to a sector saying maybe uh, cruises are going to disappear. And so I think we should use this signal from, I mean, markets many times are wrong, but I think they're giving a strong signal that there are sectors that may not, uh, may not survive. Let me give you one. Uh, this is for Laurent who mentioned before we started that she's waiting the day she will go to Venice. Uh, uh, Venice is under a huge uncertainty. Because we all discussed for years that Venice was killed by the cruises, by, by the 30,000 um, uh, people uh, going uh, to Venice per, per day. And if it is true that cruises are going to disappear, Venice has to, needs to reinvent itself, become a different city. So betting on the right industry is hugely important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Laurent, uh, you mentioned the two scenarios, uh, and uh, in the case uh, of uh, the, the worst scenarios, uh, we would have, of course, a sort of W kind of uh, uh, recovery, I assume, because uh, this would mean that, uh, you know, in the fall, uh, there would be uh, another huge problem with, uh, with, uh, with the pandemic, and then, therefore, uh, the recession would be prolonged. In that case, uh, you know, what is the fundamental uh, takes of the outlook? And uh, so I think in, in that case, our main worry is you get deeper, you, you not only get a prolonged slowdown, but uh, what Francesco was, was saying just at the minute, it, which is the natural tendency to protect uh, jobs and to protect firms and, and to and to you know be very slow on this reallocation of capital will become um, will become even more of an issue because then governments will want and and very understandably to protect workers. But I think one one of the feature uh, which worries us a lot uh, in that case is uh, this crisis is creating inequality and divergence. Um, and if we have a W, this would be even deeper. And what I mean by that is. Um, it's much more difficult to manage, for example, in emerging mar in emerging market than it is for advanced economies. They have uh, emerging markets, as you know, have less equipped healthcare sector. Um, there's a large share of informal workers, so it's more difficult to do confinement, and it's more difficult to protect people from confinement. Um, they are dependent on commodity prices for some, and they've been subject to the most abrupt and deepest capital outflows of any uh, crisis. And a lot of them rely on external funding to keep going. Um, so this 
this crisis is affecting them much more and that's that's one of our worry and concern and the other thing is we can also have this divergence within Europe where we are seeing that countries which have been hit first which had the strictest containment which are more specialized in services than in manufacturing um, which uh, which were less prepared in some cases they are being hit much more than others and if this this crisis uh, was to repeat even if a more subdued form but so that growth in, GD, um, in 2021 would be very low then we would it would worsen these trends and that's that's something that worries us very very much Sure, sure, sure. And uh, this, this would be a really, of course, uh, dramatic. And uh, uh, Francesco, do, do you see uh, also a similar uh, outlook in the case uh, of, uh, of uh, another, uh, let's say, problem in, in the fall? So something which is dramatic in the, in the long run? Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know. Uh, my view is that we are at least more prepared, I think, at least in Italy. Uh, we learned a lot in this dramatic spring. So I think many mistakes were done in good faith in many cases. Um, so I think if there is another if the return of the virus, I think we are we are more uh, much more prepared. I think it will return in some form. form. The issue is only how, how strong. Uh, that's why I think that preparing for a world we, where we have to live with, for example, uh, distancing, which makes many activities complicated, uh, is something we need uh, we need to do. Yeah, yeah of, of course. Think, sure. Go ahead. If I can rebound on them, I completely agree. Which is which is why I insist when we have the return, it's 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 less in intensity, obviously, that than we had before. It, but it's on a weaker economy. But we've also. One of the reasons I was insisting on the flexibility and agility of policymakers is precisely that you have to protect some sort of people because the some categories of people because the most affected workers, uh, the most affected sectors, sorry, are where the, there's a high proportion of young people, a high proportion of low qualified people, um, a high proportion of non-standard form of contract. So there, it's a vulnerable po population that will need to be supported not only with income, but, but with training and with help to find a new job. Um, but I think we can be confident also because we've learned about this in the first phase of the crisis, but also because Europe, um, I think in, in some way, unlike in the financial crisis, or so in a much better way than in a financial crisis, has done a lot more. Uh, Francesco, many economists, including uh, me, have long argued that we needed um, the central bank support to be at least matched by the by some fiscal support, and we needed some central um, fiscal support, and and we have done a giant step. Um, in that direction during this crisis. And so this is really the positive angle, I would say. And uh, one thing that, uh, that, uh, that Laurent, you mentioned is that this is an incredible occasion for innovation. At the same time, Francesco mentioned the short-termism of, of politics uh, that uh, you know, is less interested in uh, thinking long run. And so again, I, I would like to, to, to have you both uh, uh, discussing a little bit how we can uh, you know, go beyond this puzzle, which is really the problem, I would say, of modern democracies, in which uh, you clearly you have potential incentives to, for the long run, but at the same time, politicians that just care for uh, being voted again in the next uh, elections, like it is happening, of course, in, uh, in, uh, in the United States, but also it's the classic, uh, you know, uh, song that is sung in Italy. So how can, you know, society in general evolve, uh, given that apparently, again, banks are providing resources, uh, central banks are, are going in the right direction. So how we can um, evolve towards this trade-off uh, between short and long term? And I'm asking this because again, for example, for universities, this is something incredibly important. So investing in digital and distance learning, and Francesco knows this very well, is a, a unique opportunity in a lifetime. At the same time, the risk is that most of these funds will be used 
to self-reinforce the you know departments that are not doing the right thing the type of uh, you know teaching which is uh, the old style and so how can we really so what is the the fundamental uh, you know recipes uh, that you both uh, can provide us with uh, you know uh, uh, having you know this uh, pandemic as a, a potential solution of many problems uh, in addition to uh, uh, finding a vaccine I don't know who wants to start. This is a one billion question. <laughs> the, the wise person yeah. is Francesco. <laughs> <laughs> this allows me to be short and uh, let Laurent do it. I think we have, and it's very difficult, we have to move from uh, an attitude by government, which is to protect workers, which as Laurent said, uh, is crucial because workers need to be protected but to a next step, which is protect and prepare. Prepare them for a different world, for a different job. If we only protect, and the incentive of government is to protect the voter uh, for until the next election, so he votes again, uh, this is going to be a disaster because the world is going to change and these workers will have wasted the opportunity to prepare uh, for, for a different job. And, but this is difficult because there is a natural incentive to uh, create what the Japanese call zombie forms, to keep alive firms that have, uh, that have no future. Uh, again, uh, go back to the example of, uh, of cruises. I think that with COVID-19, 2021, uh, putting 3,000 people in a small space, space on a cruise is not the future. So if we spend money, to in, for example, in Italy, we are, we have a relatively excellent specialization in building these very large ships. Um, if we give them public support to keep the shipyards alive, that is a disaster because I don't think this will have a future. Yes, makes a lot of sense. Loran? Yeah, so we share this. Um expertise of building large ship as our <laughs> common history yeah, of many things. Actually, we, uh, just, say. Uh, we just merged the Italian and the yes. French uh, shipyard company, no? So now we have two Absolutely. in the wrong direction. Uh, after, yeah, after, after long years of discussions, yes. uh, we've, we've managed to do it. Um, so I completely agree, and I will steal the expression protect and prepare because I, I really, it was one of the highlights of the OECD economic outlook to explain that, you know, we need to help people change job. We, and the same with the zombie firms that we need to help uh, entrepreneur restructure and close down if necessary and start again without Sigma bankruptcy procedure. As you know, in Europe, they're extremely complicated and sometimes you cannot open a new firm for one, two or three years. And that's, that's where we need to, where governments need to become more proactive and accelerate this process, find fast track processes for firms to keep them out, to keep this process out of court. And for people, I think there's really, we can take inspiration from some countries like Denmark, where um, the people who are going to, you know, who are in sectors who will be weaker, they're identified, they're being trained, the job placement uh, company really help them. Uh, write CV, find a new job. If it doesn't work, do it again. And, you know, not letting the person alone and, and really accompanying along this road. And I think it will be super uh, important to do that. Um, the, but the third thing, the, the thing I wanted to say is we're not coming out of a vacuum. Everything is um, is more or less a trend of what has happened before and and tends to evolve with um, with history. I'll, I'll take you, I'll take one example. In the previous crisis, um, a lot of governments really pressed by this idea that you know the economy had to start fast again. Um, in supported a lot their automotive industry, regardless of the environmental impact, regardless of condition and governance and things like that. Uh, I think in this crisis it, it is very different. Perhaps because we're going to be in a difficult situation and in this transition period for longer. But if you look, for example, at France and Germany, there has been no support for the automotive car without condition on environment. 
the same thing I think we learned from the TARP uh, support in the US during the financial crisis and the, the support that's being provided now is heavily conditioned by a better governance and more transparency. Another example, you, even airline industry, um, which are being rescued, uh, it's with targets related to climate change. Even so, it's a lot more difficult for airplane uh, than what it is for cars. So I think I think it's going in that direction. And one thing which um, which I strongly believe is if the government spends money in equipping small firms, very small firms with digital tools so that they can become a lot more uh, agile using them, leveraging on them for deliveries, for couriers, for many things, then then we can give a push um, in the right direction. But the, the transition birds are difficult, they are challenging, um, and this one will be as well. But we have the tools to make it better. And so now we, 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 we have uh, the, the expertise and, and the tools for sure. So do you agree, Francesco, with this? Yeah, the, uh, Laurence just said something uh, very politely, but something very important, that in Europe we have the example, at one, one important example, which is Germany. Germany, before the crisis, was ready to revamp the German car industry as it was, essentially. And now, uh, Mrs. Merkel has clearly said, not a euro if you are not going to change your automotive model. This is hugely important because it's also hugely unpopular in, in Germany. Uh, I must say, Gianmario, that is going to go to Italy, that we are understandably for some reason, but are not going in that direction. We are giving public support to existing um, car factories uh, that produce existing cars with very little uh, pressure to, to change the model. So we risk putting a lot of money into, so to protect jobs, because these jobs will be there, but probably five years from now, nobody will buy those cars. So we've thrown the money away. Well, this, I think Germany has behaved very differently in this case. Well, we are getting many comments from, from the audience and everybody's enthusiastic by the, the quality of conversation that you both have. From the are, car industry, uh, we're getting a lot of comments. <laughs> no, no, of course, they, they are not included probably in the, in the chat. No, neither the cruise nor the car industry. <laughs> but uh, uh, someone is asking exactly how we can make this, this transition, right? Because you both uh, you know, mentioned sustainability, uh, uh, green, uh, again, innovation, I would say, more generally, right? So, so this is uh, the case for innovation, which in these years, which are years of the fourth industrial revolution, which should really, you know, I, I when I teach to my students, when I used to teach to my students, I used to say, you know, 100 years ago is exactly the same moment, right? When electricity was there, you know, th lots of entrepreneurship, lots of change in the society. How can we, we do that now? Because uh, again, someone is asking, how we can transition, you know, workers from their current job uh, to their future jobs. Uh, of course, this is about education, but uh, even before is about uh, having leaders that uh, make this transition. So sorry for these, uh, you know, very uh, uh, pragmatic questions, difficult to, to answer, but uh, this is really the problem because sometimes it's like we are kind of stuck in the middle. Now we have resources, which is the good news uh, at this point, but, uh, and we are seeing this, for example, in Italy, right, Francesco, also with this debate, we have this uh, study generally, we are, it seems that we, we keep postponing the moment in which we try to, you know, bring down to uh, this, uh, this fundamental, uh, you know, energy into uh, the factories, into, into the new jobs. Um, is there a, a, anything more that you would like to share on this, given that there are three or four people that are really asking how we can really do the innovation? How can we really make this type of transition? <laughs> what should politics do in order to do that? This time I let Laurent start. <laughs> Again, Laurence, I mentioned, I mean, she's been advisor of the, the French prime minister, and so she knows very, very well how it is hard uh, to transform, you know, the theory of economics into the practice of, uh, of economics. And so what is uh, your additional takes on this? Uh, so I... So thanks for letting me answer the difficult question, Francesco. Um, <laughs> it's uh, uh, a couple of ideas. The, the first thing I... The first thing I would like to say is we're, we're living in the European Union with a single market, meaning we have 355 million potential consumers. That's a lot. So 
So the market for firms and for innovation is huge. One of the things that uh, we were recommending here and that the US, for example, has done or the French had done in the previous crisis um, is to have this fund for innovation, which have very clear rules. It's, you, it's a big fund. It's a pocket of money from the state. It's focusing on one area of innovation, for example, let's say e-commerce. Um, it's headed by experts appointed there for five years. Mm -hmm. And it's running on competition and they select project through a competition. They let the people, uh, they give money to the other people in charge of the project and they let them go uh, on the idea that some of the project it's, you know, for a private investor, very difficult to fund because it has externalities they cannot take into account because it's very risky or for a variety of reasons and that that is a big boost of innovation it would lead to um, uh, internet in the us and many other novelties so i think europe can afford to do that that's that's one thing to do to boost innovation obviously it has to be run through competition and in the us for example they change the people selecting the project every five years so that's uh, very efficient another point i think uh, which to me is super important. So Francesco will be able to say whether it works well in Italy, but if I take apprenticeship, for example, you have four times as many young people in apprenticeship in Germany as you have in France. And yet it's a very good way of learning a job, of learning how to work in a job. It can be done at any type, uh, any degree of your studies, uh, whether you're in tertiary education, secondary or below secondary education. And that gives, a, that helps people get a job, whatever the level of education is. Um, and if I look at the case of France, my country, then we're, we're very bad at taking care of people who, who are not reaching tertiary education. And Germany is very good. We should, we could do something like that, especially during this period of transition when it will be difficult for the people who are stepping into the labor market for the first time to find a job. Um, so I, I can go on for longer, but I'm sure Francesco has much better idea. No, I think... <clears throat> Apprenticeship, if uh, uh, France has many less than Germany, Italy has one third of what France has. So it be, and it's important because you start uh, approaching a job when you are still very flexible and you can you can also contribute to changing to changing the job. So uh, that's certainly important. I think on the I think there are two aspects there. The youth aspect if you want, it's relatively easy in the sense we have to change uh, our schools, uh, our, the transition from school to work, we have to change our universities, but that is all possible. The really difficult part is what to do with someone who is uh, 45, she has, she has 20 more years uh, as an active worker and uh, realizes that uh, the job should not be there because it's not in the country's interest to keep that job alive and that is much more complicated because retraining at that age is, uh, is obviously much harder and that i think where the uh, the pressure for no change and keeping what should not be kept is stronger i i have no solution i think i would concentrate the effort on on, on that category of middle-aged people the, the young is, needs to be done but in a sense is, is easier this is interesting because we have had, uh, at least in Italy, an advisory team uh, that has been working for the government, uh, headed, by the way, by a Bocconi alumnus, Vittorio Colau. And this is a fundamental point, which, in fact, the team has uh, raised as something that we should do, this one of these uh, apprenticeships. We just have a few minutes left. And I, have, sure. I have one question. Because oh, sure, 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 sure. Uh, completely different. Um, we... Uh, the world has been inundated by money, much money, more mid, mid trillions. Uh, are we going to have a big inflation, which will solve all the debt issues in the next years? Is the OECD worried about a big inflation? By I the should way, ask you this question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. Did this answer actually? This is a question that was already into the. So this is very important question, by the way. So there are three or four people that mentioned this before. Go ahead, Laura. So. It, 
Yeah, so so it's been a real headache to um, to be transparent to to try and answer these questions. Um, uh, as you know, if we think that capital as and the supply side of the economies is barely affected, uh, whereas demand has dropped and and runs the risk of remaining subdued because of lack of confidence because of the virus being here, um, then then we tend to think, and that's our projection. That inflation will continue to go down. There will be no price pressure, except in sub sectors which are being disrupted by the crisis, like food, because migrants uh, cannot cross border to come and pick up vegetables or, or food. Francesco, yes, the uh, difficult. <laughs> the, oh, okay, so so sorry. it went off. Yeah, yeah no, so, no, so no. you can you, go ahead. But in the end, the, the, the project... Okay, so we had low inflation. Do I move to... Huh. Yeah, yes. the projection are for inflation going lower. That's... Um, but, I mean, the worst of the world, and you know it is, is if um, the supply decreases because, as you say, no more cruises. Um, uh, and, and so supply decreases on aggregate, and then you've got some pressure from demand. But... Um, the, the nice scenario is this work, we do the transition, people manage to adjust, the state, you know, has a, is, is a benevolent dictator with a long term horizon. And then there's so much liquidity that effectively it fuels demand and growth goes up, not only real growth, but inflation. Um, and this helps us with the debt. So, Francesco, you wanted I to add... that's when you put happy end. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope. No, I agree with you. I think the probability of, uh, of a high inflation is low. But uh, first of all, we teach our students there is a relationship between money and prices, so eventually it hits you. And second, there is also, if you want, an incentive that maybe the way we are going to get out of this mountain of debt is with a bit... If you look at how uh, debt was solved in the past, has been either with very high growth, which doesn't seem in the cards, or uh, or some unexpected inflation. So th we should keep this in our mind when we invest thinking at our retirement. So I, go ahead, Loran. I was about to say I agree with you, but some of your former students at the OECD also believe that perhaps we will have a productivity shift uh, with this crisis that would go for the real growth solution but uh, as you say we should we should be and that was the theme i think we should be ready for a large variety of possibilities yeah. but this is so we go back to the, this is really the positive end because if we go down the reallocation avenue the reallocation avenue means an increase in productivity which is uh, what you're saying but that's why realize that you don't have to protect the existence before no matter what is the crucial political aspect of this uh, transition. So I think the time is over and uh, uh, I think this has been a fantastic debate. So let me wholeheartedly thank uh, uh, Lawrence for uh, sharing with us uh, the fundamental highlights uh, of uh, the OECD uh, latest uh, outlook, economic outlook. Thank you so much, uh, Laurent. Well, thank you, Jean Mario, and it's been a and thanks, Francesco. It's it's been a fantastic way of ending the week. So thanks very much. And thank you also, Francesco, for sharing also your insightful vision on the future. I think the debate really gave us uh, you know some given the uncertainty because we, we as as Laurent said at the very beginning, given the uncertainty and the difficulty of making projections in these days, I think we have plenty of tips. Uh, uh, thanks to, to, to both of you, uh, for politicians uh, really to, to do the right thing in the next, uh, in the next week. So I, I, I really thank you very much. And uh, I look yeah. forward to have Loran also guest here in Bocconi when, when it will be possible to travel, not only in Venice, but also in Milan. <laughs> <laughs> we do, and, pleasure. and read the OECD report, which is, uh, which is very, we didn't allow Loran a lot of time to explain, but it's very interesting. So go on the website of the OECD and read the report. Uh, absolutely, thank absolutely. You. So thank you very much to all of you for- Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye, have a good weekend.